tape four, Mrs. Toby Weiner. You were working in the labor camp in the ammunition factory. factory. And, you know, the war was coming to an end, and the, the planes were coming, and we were so happy to hear that the plane, and they were bombing the nearby cities. Of course, uh, when the siren went off that the planes were coming, of course they were looking to bomb the factories and also the railroad tracks because every night from the bunkers, it was underground, like big basement, mile long, where they, where they put all the ammunition away for the war to transport it to the front for the Germans. So when, you see, they, they, they saved them in, in the bunker, but every night, was packed on a, on a train. It was already boxed. We were stamping it, and from that room it went to another room, and from another room, another room, where they put it in the wooden boxes. And a lot of Jewish men was carrying these bombs and putting them on a train. Every time, and then a couple times they took us out because they needed us so badly, the bomb on the front, so they took the girls out and they told us to go all the way into the bunker. Two of us should hold the cart, you know, and bring it out to the train. Of course, we couldn't lift it to put it on the train, but a lot of, not only Jewish people were there, a lot of Polacks were there, you know, and uh, it was a lot of gypsies even there. But far as I know, a lot of Polish uh, uh, people were there and a lot of Jewish people in the striped clothes, in the striped pants, you know, the Auschwitz clothes. And we bore out from the bunker the bomb and they put it up there. Every time we put it up there, we wish that should come and blow it up. And all of a sudden we heard that the, the train was we filled up with the bomb. The Americans bombed it because it was a big explosion, big ex explosion there. And they were beating those people so hard by the train, those who were packing it up to the train this bomb, they beat them to death. Luckily, we wasn't beaten, you know. Then when we went back to the factory and the siren came off that the Americans are bombing, then they took us to the bunker. Uh, what would they call bunker here? Uh, bunker? Bu you know, underground when war, the bomb shouldn't get you. So. One night when they were bombing Torgo, they threw a bomb, you could imagine, right in front of our bunker where all the girls were, with the, with the German woman was hiding under the ground. In the bomb shelter. In the bomb shelter, that's it, a bomb shelter. One bomb came down straight by the door just about we able to open the door this much and we saw the big bomb with the, with the front down, with the pointy, in the mud, and it didn't explode. So we were saved again. We were saved already uh, when they was uh, picking us out, when we was running from one barrack. We were saved when we were by the crematorium. We were saved already so many times. So I guess I always said my parents who were killed must pray for us that we should, everything should, we should survive. So we came out and the Dutch woman said, said it in German. They gave me a name, Stubi. 
a dog. Once the German woman asked me, asked me if I could knit. Of course, I was very good at knitting. And she told me I should knit her a skirt. And she gave me a pattern. And if you want to know the truth, I bought the pattern with me after the war, and I made my children beautiful knitted dresses with all the dancing girls around it. And I made this German woman a, a skirt. She gave me the instruction paper, and I made it. It came out beautiful. And for that, because I was doing the knitting for her, on my time when I was supposed to sleep, you know, then we went to the restaurant, and she saw my bitter eyes that I was so hungry. She said, come here. And she gave me her plate of soup. So I took the soup, and everybody had a zip who was around me, and I gave everybody a little soup from that. She gave me the soup. It was mushroom in it or Frankfurter in it or something, but she gave me for that the soup. She didn't want to eat it, and she said, come here. And she gave me, and I ran back with the soup, and everybody had a zip from it. Your treatment at Torgo was different than it at Auschwitz? It was better, because we, they needed us to work. They needed uh, the labor, so they gave us eat before we went to work. And then when we came back, in the morning we went to sleep. Around 4 o'clock they took us to work again. You know, So that was once that she gave me the woman. And then I was working in a munition factory, sitting with my sister on one bench. You know, it was Wehrmacht, and it was Nazis. And they did not support the Nazis, but they put them to work into the ammunition factory. And I remember it was this very old man who was overlooking the work and he was very sorry for me because I cried. Every night I cried with tears because I was so hungry, I was so sick. And my sister said, don't cry, God will help me. And I kept saying, don't even mention again God because I'm going to turn you over with this bench. If you're going to mention God, how could I suffer like this? So this old German Wehrmacht it was Christmas Eve, and he bought me in a little bag, hiding a couple cookies, a little muffins, and an onion. And he said to me, I bought it for you because I'm sorry for you, but if they will find me that I give you this, I'm going to pay my life. And he gave me this little bag and I pushed it into the into my blouse so so uh, that's what happened in Torgo were you more optimistic when you were in Torgo than yes I said maybe maybe we'll survive maybe we'll survive if you're going to work hard you're going to survive Tell but after, after uh, when the war was coming to a close, and the Führer was had a big office on the property there, you know, who overlooked us. He gave he had an order to shoot us all out into the Elbe River, take us out that night because they knew it, the the war is so close, so they didn't want us give us over to the Americans or to the Russians. They didn't want to see what they did. So the Führer got 250 bullets for the 250 girls, and he had an order to take us out to the Melbury Elbe. I think it was Elbe River, they said, and shoot us all and kill us. And that night, when 
was so close already to that camp, the Americans were already bombing Torgo, the light, the whole city was burning, you know, thank God. Then the Führer wanted to take us out to kill us. So some Polak or somebody from the, already got loose somewhere, took a gun and through the window shot the Führer. So he was saved again. He had already trouble with himself. He shot him through the, here on the arm. So then he ran away. The, the German women with these uh, culotte skirts took their bicycles and they ran. That night they all ran away. And they ran away with the Führer. All of the German oh, officers? Wait a minute. No, the Führer didn't go. The Führer was in his office bleeding, calling in the Jewish doctor to help him. So she was helping him. But this Jewish doctor was beaten up so from that Führer that they brought her out on a stretcher once, you know. She, so then the Americans, I don't know how it happened, but the Führer couldn't run far. He needed help. So they took him to a hospital in Eilenburg. We didn't know where they took him. But no Germans was on a camp. So we see, and the doors, the, the gate was open. So we said, well, the war is over. What are we sitting here? Let's go and find some food. I started going, I was the first one. And my sister came and we ran into the city of Torgo. The buildings were all bombed and and a lot of bombs you could have seen on the ground. But I didn't care. I just went into that house. And I found some jars of fruit, what they prepared for themselves. And I opened the jar and I looked for food. Whatever I found, I ate. Then from there, we went to a factory. We was nearby a factory. And we ran there. First, it was so funny. When I got into that basement, it was white damask pillows in a bed. And I said, oh my God, I said, will I ever be sleeping in this pillow again? I don't believe it. So I went and I stretched myself. I said, I have to, before I go further, I want to see what is it like to sleep here. So I jumped up and I went further. You know, it was, we was happy already. And then we went to this factory, and there was for the Germans all the food that they shipped out to the front. And it was a lot of cakes, like little honey cakes. Well, I was so happy, and I started eating that. And then I saw two, it was harmonicas, you know? And me, so, oh, before I got out of that house, from the German's house, I started looking, and as a young girl, I found a beautiful dress and a beautiful shawl with beads, and beads was such a big thing, you know. I said, oh, I'm going to be able to make beads for my neck. I'm going to take the shawl, and I'm going to take this dress, and I grabbed it, put it in my big uh, dress there, and I took that shawl and that dress, and then I went to the factory, and I found this cake, and I ate that, and I packed that up as much as I was able to with, to carry. And there was the two harmonicas. I always loved music. So I figured, well, maybe one day I'm going to play this. So I took one on my back, and I took one to my front. And also, what I found, <laughs> food. But we have to go back, because the Russian, that night, came in, and the Americans didn't find yet this camp. So we went, we had already food to eat there, and we went to sleep, because we didn't know where to go or what to do. So, 
so uh, that night the Russian came in, the soldiers, not too many, a few of them, and we were 250 girls. Of, go of course, they was hungry for women, and they was trying to rape you. But we were 250 girls, and it was six or seven soldiers, so the girls grabbed them and pulled them always off, you know. So then it got, in the morning, they went back to the city, to their station. Next morning, the Americans came. Well, we were very happy that the Americans came in and they asked us, how many are we, and so on, and he said that we're going to have to walk to Eilenburg, some nearby, nearby city, but we shouldn't get non-Jews between us because the Germans was fleeing away, you know. So he gave us little mezuzahs in the neck. And he said, this way, nobody going to be able to come between you to say that they Jews too. And then we went to Eilenburg. We walked with the Americans. It wasn't too far. And there was a big hotel with German people. So they chased the American soldiers, chased all the Germans out, and they said we need the place for the refugees, you know, for the survivors. Of course, we was filthy, dirty, louse, you know. And they let us into the hotel, in this German hotel, and they bathed us there, you know. We went to bathe, and they told them to make us some food, course, you couldn't eat much because you got a lot of people got sick, you know, from starting eating. And uh, then he 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 asked us. We was there a couple of days, and um, then I found a bicycle. I never forget it. In a hotel, the Germans ran away, and I found the bicycle, and. A German came to me and said to me, wants to get my bicycle, wants to buy my bicycle, you know. And I gave him the bicycle, he gave me a ring, an onyx ring. I said, well, I won't be able to take the bicycle anyhow. So he, won he took off a ring and he gave me a gold ring with an onyx stone. I carried that ring all the way to Belgium, and then I that went down in a sink, you know. So from there, the Americans came and asked us, do you want to go home? I said, oh, yeah, I want to go home. So my sister said, no, we're not going home. Where are you going to go home? Who's going to be home? Nobody's home. Everybody's dead. So... Uh, the bosses came and they said, whoever wants to go back to their city, Hungary or Czechoslovakia or different places, the boss will take them. I wanted to go home because I said, maybe my mother, maybe my father, maybe my... My sister pulled me off the bus and she didn't let me go. And she said, we're going to go to America. My mama's brothers is there in America. I said, you don't even know where they are. How are we going to go? She said, I remember the address. It's 830 North 2nd Street, Philadelphia. And I'm going to send them a telegram, and I'm going to tell them that we three, four survived because my mother's sister's daughter was with us. And uh, so then the rabbi said, if you don't want to go home, we're going to try to get you to Belgium. And then the rabbi put us on a train. And, of course, the Hayas was connected with them, you know. And they took us to Belgium, to Brussels. And the Hayas took us over right there, waited for us, and put us into different apartments, so many girls. And then they saw that we were so worn out and, and young yet. So they said, these children need a little rest to recuperate. 
So then they send us about for four or five weeks to, I think, I'm not sure it was Liege or Namur, it's in a mountain somewhere, to a kinder a, ki a camp. And we had such a good time there. We ate, we was able to wash, and they gave us some clothes. And we had for about four or five weeks a good time. Then we, they brought us back to Brussels, and the Jewish uh, high ass again took us over, and they sent us to Antwerpen. Then we was in Antwerpen, and uh, in Antwerpen, the Jewish committee took us in. They didn't have much room, and a big hall. They put cots down, you know, and was 40, 50, or 60, or I don't even know how many slept in one room, you know. Boys, girls, don't matter. I mean, you didn't have in mind anything else, just that you survived and was happy to be alive. And then I said to my, and then I got sick. I had an infection on my side of my nose, and it blew up like that. And the girls went to rent to the I asked to the Jewish committee, they say that this child is laying on the floor with 404 fever. Come help her because she'll die. So they took, us, took me in with an ambulance to a hospital, to a nun's hospital. Every hour they gave me a shot because it was almost the pus on my brain. So I was in a hospital for uh, I don't know how long exactly, but then I survived, I didn't die. You know, God helped me again. They were very nice. The, the Flemish uh, Antwerp nurses were very nice, and they worked on me. And they came every morning to pray by my bed because they thought I was going to die from this infection. But I got out of there, too. Now I said to my sister, went back to this big hall. They didn't know what to do with so many people. So they gave us eat and they took care of us. I said to my sister, we weren't allowed to work in Antwerpen. But I said to my sister, let's go out and get a job, anything, just to not live like this. So I met a couple who survived, who was hiding, and they came back and he found his beautiful big house and a restaurant. He went to open up a restaurant on, in store with this Romanian woman who always was, uh, also was in Antwerpen, but was hiding in Switzerland somewhere. And they came back, and they went in partners, and I asked her, would she give me a job? I will do anything in the kitchen. And I could cook. I didn't even know how to cook. I said, I will, I know. I never said I don't know. I, anything they asked me, I said, yes, I know. And she took me in. Because I worked, she gave us two rooms upstairs. Well, it was already heaven in Antwerpen. We were, my uncle got the, the, the telegram, and we said where we are. And my aunt sent us every week $10. And $10 was so much money that we was able to buy butter, rolls. And I never saw grapefruit before. And I bought grapefruit, bananas, excuse me, I didn't know how to eat the bananas. I wanted to eat it with the skin, and they said, no, you have to peel the bananas. Because I never saw in Europe bananas and grapefruit. Oranges was not lemon. So we had already very good, because I was working. We had a couple rooms, and then we applied to how to come to America. And you were living with your two sisters? My two sisters and my cousin. And we had a little stove, and she cooked, and my aunt sent us packages for everybody, one pack of old clothes. And my, my sister and my cousin knew how to sew, and they took it apart, and ironed it, and we cut it, excuse me, and we cut it and made dresses. So we was dressed already like human beings. And... Uh, then the Jewish brigade came, you know, from Palestine. And a lot of them came to look for their sister and for uh, 
the brother, they, maybe they found because they were in Israel. They, and it wasn't Israel at that time, it was, it was Palestine. But these Hayals were so nice and they said to us, well, I want to take you to a dance. Well, now we're dancing with all the tzoras we had, we went out. He's going to take us to a party, to a hall, and it was music, and, and they wanted us to come back to life again. And uh, so, so it was a, a new life. When did you come to America? In 1947, 1945, uh, I was deliberated. 1940, from 45 to 47 March, I was like wandering from Brussels and a home and and in Antwerpen. But thank God it was a new life because we was safe. And uh, you came with your family. I came. No. We applied for a visa and affidavit, and of course they didn't let too many Jews in America at that time yet. But they made it very hard. They didn't want us here, and and finally we came on a Romania quota. And every quota they let in so many people, so we came. We fell in only two of us. Here we was four of us. Now who's gonna go? By this time, my cousin met a boy who came back from Auschwitz, and he wanted to marry her, and she said she's going to get married, and she's not going to come to America. So she gave over her affidavit, her visa, to my sister, because I was supposed to come and my cousin, because only two, two affidavits came to come. But she decided that she had enough already suffering. If this boy, she had nobody. She lost the whole family. She lost her mother, father, and six children. She was the seventh. So she had nobody else except us. And she said, well, this young man is a goldsmith. He was uh, doing jewelry. And I'm going to get married. He, he's, by that time, the boy's parents who were in hiding in Switzerland came back to Antwerpen. So he had already a family who survived. And she remained and she gave over the visa for my sister Cecile. So now me and Cecile came to America March 